Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the IHS Market Technology Group webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Today's webinar is Satellite Backhaul, Debunking Misconceptions. There are many myths and misconceptions surrounding the use of satellite in the mobile backhaul market. So our panel will explore the progress satellite has made in terms of viability, performance, and affordability, and explore why it is a preferred choice, not a last resort. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS Market and our partner, Gilat Satellite Networks. So before we get started, I want to highlight some features that are available for you on our webinar today. So the console that you're looking at is completely customizable. So this means you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange your console as you like. Now you're going to notice a number of application widgets at the bottom of your screen. These contain additional features available for you. I do want to call out the resource list widget, and this is where you're going to find additional material about today's topic, including the downloadable slide deck from our session today, as well as other valuable resources. We've also included a Twitter widget, and you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. And this means that you'll be able to tweet directly from within the console. And today we're using the hashtag SatelliteBackhaul. Now we're also going to have a live Q&A session directly after the presentation, so please submit any questions or comments during the webinar by using that Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And if you have any technical issues whatsoever, just click on that question mark widget and you'll get the answers that you need. So now let me introduce our panel. First leading our discussion is Richard Webb. Richard is Director of Research and Analysis in the Service Provider Technology segment at IHS Market. And rounding out our panel, we have Dorit Oren. Dorit is Director of Product Marketing at Gilat Satellite Networks. So welcome to both Richard and Dorit. It's great to have you with us. And now I would like to turn the controls over to Richard so we can get started. Richard. Okay, thank you, Alan. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. So we're going to take a quick look at market trends just to give a little bit of context to our discussion. And without further ado, we'll dive right in. So the mobile network is evolving, as I'm sure you're aware, and, and very much part of that evolution is the changing nature of the radio endpoints that are being added to the network, not just macro cells, but of course small cells, remote radio heads in CRAN architectures, DAS, Wi-Fi, all of which are generating traffic and in most cases adding more demands to the mobile backhaul network. So backhaul needs to be increasingly flexible. Um, if we look at the transport technologies available, there's definitely no universal solution. On the wireline side, technologies such as fiber and pawn and next-gen copper are not always available, and if they are, not always affordable. On the wireless side, solutions based on microwave spectrum also have challenges. Firstly, the cost of that spectrum, uh, the requirement for line of sight connectivity, and also being prone to atmospheric interference. But the good news is there is an alternative to that, one that is increasingly available and cost effective, and that is satellite. Satellite is very much an up and coming solution, and in today's webinar we're going to explore how its performance and cost characteristics make it viable as a solution for backhaul now and also in the future. But first, to give a little more context and to show how demanding things are for backhaul, I'm just going to look at some of the considerations around backhaul connectivity. And the chart that I've put on screen is taken from an annual IHS market survey uh, of operators in which we ask the transport and transmission network managers about their strategies and technology choices for backhaul. In this particular question, we ask respondents to rate a list of backhaul service level agreement metrics uh, and we ask them to make that rating on a scale of 1 to 7, where 1 is not important at all, 4 is somewhat important, and 7 is critical. And what you can see on the chart is the percentage of those respondents rating each criterion as either very important or critical. So as you can see, latency is top rated as a critical SLA metric, 100% of respondents, uh, followed just behind by uptime and reliability and downstream capacity. Not too surprising, really. All of these are fundamental demands for backhaul. Uh, behind that, Jitter, 91% next highest rated SLA metric. That's also a key consideration, particularly in the delivery of time-sensitive traffic and, 
as, as you're aware, that's increasingly important for operators monetizing video, rich, rich media services, and so on. Um, so low latency, low jitter, critical in maintaining uh, service, in maintaining timing and synchronization in particular, uh, and that is required for smooth handoff between small cells, macro cells, and all those other radio endpoints that I mentioned in the previous slide. So later we're going to examine how satellite holds up against some of these expectations for backhaul. But I also want to look at some of those use cases beyond backhaul that are emerging for satellite connectivity. Now you're probably pretty familiar with the notion of satellite being used for backhaul cells deployed in rural and remote areas, and of course satellite can serve those needs very effectively, but it does have other backhaul applications too, and we're going to be looking at some of those later. And, and as we will show, uh, I hope, through, through the webinar, uh, satellite capacity is rising fast, and this is one of the, 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 the myths that we are looking to debunk through today's webinar. And in, at the same point as that capacity capability is, is rising, the number of areas that can be reached by satellite are also increasing. Uh, and that means that connectivity is coming down in cost, so the number of cell sites uh, that, that could potentially use satellite backhaul are rising, not just in those rural areas, but also in metro and uh, urban deployments and small cell deployments and those other radio endpoints too. So there's a, a broadening range of applications that uh, can benefit from it. And, and this point about cost is, is key, and, and whilst we'll be looking at it in more detail later on, I just want to reiterate it here at the top of the webinar. Um, when a proportion of mobile operator cell sites reached by satellite increase and the cost per gigabit per month for satellite backhaul falls, there's, there's something of a tipping point for operators, a, a point at which the, the comparable price for terrestrial wireline or microwave backhaul is matched or bettered by satellite, and that makes it economically viable as a solution for those cell sites. So, Hopefully that gives us a little bit of context to kick us off in terms of backhaul requirements, but also whet your appetite to hear more about next-gen satellite within the context of mobile backhaul and some of those other applications. And as we do that, I want you to consider the one key challenge that really persists for satellite, and that challenge is really around perception. I'll admit, as a long-time mobile backhaul analyst, I had misperceptions around satellite, particularly around three things, uh, and those things were cost, and the performance of satellite, and its applicability. And, and I still really thought of satellite in terms of legacy capabilities. Uh, and we're going to investigate some perceptions and the pervading myths around what satellite is and what it is not by looking at cost and performance and availability, but looking at it in the next-gen satellite context. And, and we're going to really look at the flexibility of satellite for a range of different deployment applications, the experience it gives to users, and, and the cost benefits that it can deliver. Now, I think it's fair to say that a lot of mobile operators don't understand satellite very well. Many don't really use it for backhaul, perhaps, like me being more familiar with other technologies for backhaul, and so may have perceptions about, misperceptions about it too. So I'm now going to bring in our speaker, Dorit Orin from Gilat. And, and Dorit, I think it's fair to say we need to refresh these facts about satellite as a backhaul solution. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Richard, for an interesting introduction. I'm excited to present this webinar that we chose to call Satellite Backhaul, Debunking Misconceptions. Our goal in this webinar is to demystify the false impressions around satellite backhaul and really to alleviate the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that many have about this technology. I would like to point out that satellite communication is a technology that is now going through a major shift from being only a niche play to becoming a prime time technology. This is happening particularly in several areas where cellular backhaul is one example that of course we will focus on today. 
However, it is important to note that inside communication is another area where SATCOM is becoming the technology of choice for broadband to airplane passengers. And I want to share with you that Gilat is very active in both of these domains. So as Richard asked, does satellite backhaul make sense for service providers? Well, the answer is yes. However, again, as Richard stated, perception is the main barrier. And that is what we are here to explain. Richard? Okay, so let's take one of those myths about satellite, first of all. Um, and that it cannot meet um, the requirements for LTE and in particular the latency requirements for LTE. Um, as we showed, that's a vital part of the backhaul service level agreement, as I showed in one of my slides. So, Dorit, how, do we dis how, how, how can you respond to that statement? LTE performance, can it be met with satellite? This common myth that LTE performance can't be met with satellite backhaul has really been debunked by Gilat so many times in the field that frankly it's surprising for me to hear this is still a concern, but I know that it is. Because actually we're seeing now true LTE user experience over satellite. This is because we have new modem technology, which includes a multi-core processor, additional memory, protocol optimization, and application acceleration. And this is what has enabled the world's fastest broadband for LTE backhaul over satellite. I will talk more about acceleration on the next slide, but in the meantime, I first want to focus on the performance as seen in the UCLA speed test on the right. Look at this uh, uh, chart here, or this uh, UCLA speed test uh, photo that just came up. It shows the most remarkable speed of almost 150 megabits per second to the handset. We are measuring 200 megabits per second of UDP traffic and 150 megabits per second of TCP traffic to the handset. Now this is really outstanding, true LTE user experience over satellite. So for satellite backhaul to provide the required user experience, of course the VSAT platform must be capable of overcoming the inherent satellite delay. Now this can be done by employing different techniques, such as acceleration. Now note that this is especially critical when the high bandwidth is required, such as required for LTE. Here you can see on the right the patent, the joint patent of acceleration technology by SoftBank and Gilat. This patent mitigates the latency effects. In other words, it enables delivery of a maximum user experience to end users over satellite. This joint patent enables the true LTE speed by acceleration of traffic inside the LTE GTP tunnel. I want to stress that this innovative acceleration technique for LTE traffic has been already implemented in Gilat's VSAT system. And this is what enables what I told you on the previous slide of achieving the 150 megabits per second of TCP traffic to a single handheld device. And later on in the webinar, I'll go through several examples of the super fast acceleration that is already deployed at Tier 1 networks worldwide. Now, I'd like to take a minute to talk about the implementation of the acceleration technique. You see here on the chart, uh, in, uh, the different shades of blue, a single box of integrated functionality of both the acceleration into the VSAT. Now this is what Gilad is doing in order to implement the acceleration technology. It's embedded in the VSAT. But that's not the case with many of our competitors. Often we see there an external box or a different card that does the acceleration. And that causes significant problems. And as a matter of fact, I've listed here for you, coming up on the screen now, the advantages of the integrated solution. So of course, the cost is reduced by having a single box and the single point of contact that you have for all the software and hardware issues, that's clearly uh, important, you know, the issue of accountability. But also the complexity is reduced by having a central network management system that manages both the VSAT and the acceleration functionality, and the quality of services maintained with the integrated software that enables end-to-end -end bandwidth management, 
And also, we see better performance here because that enables maximum traffic efficiency during any link condition. So it avoids the sync delay between the cards or between the boxes that is critical to packet loss during the Okay, thanks very much, Dorit. So it sounds like latency is covered, but let's look at some of those other myths around satellite backhaul, and then we put our second one up on screen for you. Um, satellite connectivity is expensive. Now, I mentioned earlier that the cost of satellite is going down, but, but what does that really mean? Uh, Dorit, could you talk us through that in a little bit more detail, please? Sure. I'd like to explain why we're seeing such a significant cost reduction. See this chart of combined info from Gilad and various analysts. This chart shows the HTS or high throughput satellite bandwidth in terms of bandwidth supply, bandwidth demand, and its price per megabits per second. On the right y-axis, you can see gigabits per second, and on the left, the y-axis, you can see the price in megabits per month. The blue on the chart shows the geostationary or geo HTS global supply. See the steep expected rise of three to four times in the supply from 2016 to 2020 due to tens of high throughput satellites that are being launched. Now, on the other hand, see now on the screen the GOHDS global demand. This is the navy blue color that came up on the screen now. This is, of course, significantly less than the supply. So now look at the red line of the weighted average of the GOHDS price as it goes down, as marked on the left-hand side y-axis in uh, dollars. And now look at the animation to show the expectation of even further price reduction due to the abundance of satellite capacity. And this is resulting from multiple launches expected of non-geo satellites, namely LEO and MEO satellites, that's the low orbit and the uh, mid middle uh, medium orbit. We are seeing, therefore, that the cost of satellite backhaul will rival terrestrial because we're going to have so many additional satellites and so much additional capacity that we're seeing really a rivaling to, of the cost of terrestrial. But in addition to the abundance of capacity that's causing the pricing to go down, there is another important issue that can significantly contribute to reduction of costs. And this is bandwidth sharing access scheme. For example, the MFTDMA or the multi-frequency time division multiple axis. Bear with me for a minute for a high-level explanation of this technical issue. Bandwidth sharing is a good fit for data-intensive networks due to the nature of 3G and LTE traffic. Now, this is because the traffic is asymmetrical. We all download much more than we upload. And also, the traffic is bursty. In other words, it has a high peak-to-average ratio, and you'll see that in the diagram in a minute. We're seeing that the traditional dedicated link, or two-way symmetrical pipe, also called SEPC, is often no longer the cost-effective access scheme, because bandwidth really should and can be adjusted according to usage for better cost. Now look at the charts that come up on the screen now. We see these charts of inbound traffic for 3G networks. Now, this data was collected by Gilad from the field, from a small cell uh, traffic patterns. And this is really both of these charts on the left and on the right is the same data, but samples at different intervals. Look on the left, samples at 10 seconds. We see here traffic that appears to have uh, averaged with the load. In other words, mobile traffic patterns tend to average with the load is the common perception. But in reality, if we sample at 0.1 seconds, you know, much of finer tuning of looking into the traffic, we see that the peak to average is 10 to 1. In other words, it's bursty traffic with this very high peak to average ratio. And this, of course, is ideal for bandwidth sharing. So using MFTDMA will give two advantages, not to waste bandwidth where it's not needed, and to provide sufficient capacity to meet the peak usage. 
And let me add one more point about the advantage of bandwidth sharing. It allows also better quality of service, and that's really in two aspects. The bandwidth sharing can be done among cell towers, and the prior to prioritization in the same cell can be done through voice and data traffic. So we're seeing here how significant the access scheme is when we're talking about cost reduction. Richard? Okay, thanks very much, Dorit. So I also mentioned earlier that the mobile network is evolving and becoming more complex. So surely the last thing any operator wants is for backhaul to get more complex too. Dorit, is satellite too complex for LTE backhaul and, and other applications, or, or can it be deployed in a way that reduces complexity? Well, Richard, there are several means to significantly reduce complexity, and I'll address a few of them. First, I'd like to say that having a global network management system, or NMS, a centralized management system for large distributed networks will enable full configuration and control and monitoring of all the hub elements, as well as the remote terminals. And this is really regardless of their physical location. In addition to simplified service fulfillment, it, this is what allows for simple configuration for each service and for each cellular site. And then we have the comprehensive service assurance, and this enables easy performance monitoring as well as traffic usage reports. And then there's an important issue of high scalability for any size network. Our NMS can allow us to start small and increase sites as needed. In other words, you can use the same NMS to cover your network as it increases in size. And the last point for reducing complexity with a global centralized NMS is the smooth integration with the operational and business support systems that are also referred to as VSS support. Now, another important aspect in simplifying the integration of satellite network into a cellular terrestrial network has to do with the network layer of which the integration takes place. And this is another uh, issue that is very important in reducing complexity. Satellite networks traditionally operate at layer three. And we're seeing that at times the operators, are, uh, their networks are operating at layer two. Now, obviously, if the satellite network can operate at a carrier grade layer two, this will reduce complexity and provide operational efficiency. In other words, we'll simplify the extension to satellite of an existing terrestrial infrastructure. So look here that there's really three important points. Simplified operations, that's because the layer two connectivity over satellite allows the operator to work in the same standard way as with any other transport. There's more connectivity options. This opens the way to use existing protocols, such as MPLS and the point-to-point -point, uh, protocol over Ethernet, and doing this over satellite now. And Transparent Layer 3 allows the customers to keep the same IP network design and operational procedures. And now, in addition to the global NMS and the layer two reducing complexity, I want to discuss how satellite backhaul can be treated as a black box. On the left, you see the familiar core network to the cellular operators. And on the right is the 3G or 4G nodes. And in between them is the satellite backhaul that can be treated as a black box. So what mobile operators need to tell the satellite backhaul vendor is the requirements. So to make it simple, it is the service level agreement and key performance indicators that need to be established, then the required site location that need to be, of course, identified, and finally the schedule that needs to be put in place. So then once the requirement is set, you consider the satellite backhaul as a black box and the satellite backhaul vendor should be able to do the rest. So see now in the diagram the analogy of a bent pipe. You have here the teleport on the left with a large antenna connected. On the right-hand side, you have the VSAT, you have the modem and the small antenna connected to the uh, node, it is a 3G or 4G node. 
and they're connected via this bent pipe in, in the sky to the satellite. And that's really the managed service that we uh, can offer to reduce the complexity. So there's a lot of details here for that, and let's take them uh, one at a time. First of the stat, let's look at these circles here inside the box, and I'll take them from left to right, uh, from top to, to bottom. So let's start with the satellite network design. This is done per the required SLA and KPI, as well as the MNOs network topology. We can perform the entire design of the satellite network. Then there's the capacity setup and management. This includes choosing the relevant satellites that are compared for uh, available capacity, location, efficiency, and so on. And this also includes the continuous monitoring of the network. This is also very important in order to optimize the satellite resources. And this is an ongoing task. And then there's the hub setup. Here we need to determine the teleports and sizing of the hub equipment, including the needed processing power and redundancy if required. The next point here is the network integration and on-site installation. This includes integration with the MNO's core network and the 3G, 4G nodes. So this is here actually what takes you out of the, the box, out of the black box of the managed service through these uh, kind of big blue arrows to either the core network or the 3G, 4G nodes. This is really the interface to the uh, network of the uh, uh, MNO. And the next point here is a 24 by 7 network operations center. This is ideally provided remotely, and we do this from multiple global sites because we want to ensure constant monitoring and operation. And the call center, this is uh, the support that ensures around-the-clock service. You want to make sure that someone is always there to pick up the phone. And finally, um, or actually two more points, the service level management. This is a critical parameter for the MNO to ensure that uh, the end users are getting the promised service quality. And last, and most important maybe, is the program management. This is the full management of the project. And it includes the logistics, the fulfillment, the uh, professional installation, the ongoing service for the network, and the VSAT site. Okay, thanks very much, Dorit. Um, uh, quickly before we move on, just a reminder to keep sending us your questions for the Q&A section. Uh, we're going to aim to get to as many of those as we can towards the end of the hour. Uh, so we're going to have a quick look at deployment applications. There's many ways in which satellite can be utilized. Uh, so we'll take a look at those. As we do, it's worth noting that the applicability of satellite, particularly for backhaul, hasn't happened by accident, but really through a convergence of several evolutionary trends within the communications industry. Uh, firstly, the ubiquity of smartphones, which is driving bandwidth demand on mobile and wireless networks, and also in a wider range of deployment scenarios. Uh, secondly, the satellite industry itself, as, as Dorit uh, was, was talking about, has launched and is in the process of launching ever more high throughput satellites, and that's boosting significantly the availability of bandwidth and significantly reducing the cost per bit. And, and thirdly, the demands for LTE backhaul and services such as voice over LTE are much better known. And, and we think those three things combine to validate satellite as a viable solution. Um, so, Dari, can you talk us through some of the examples of the different uh, applications for, for backhaul, uh, for, for satellite, not just for backhaul, but some other um, applications. And, and just to emphasize as we move on, these are all real and, and current deployments. Dari. Yes, yeah, so further to what Richard said about the viability of satellite backhaul, I'd like to share this remarkable example here we have of the significant change that we're seeing in both the capabilities and the adoption of satellite backhaul. Look on the right of this photo here, taken in a very busy metropolitan area. You can see enlarged is the VSAT on the roof used for satellite communication. This VSAT is connected via satellite uh, to a Huawei LTE cell with three sectors that servicing hundreds of end customers. Now what we have done is we've demonstrated an excellent user experience with two applications running on the handset that I'd like to share with you. 
First, I'll run the YouTube application from the handset, and then the Uber taxi application. Both will be running over satellite backhaul. This is a shout out to my ex. I'm here in love with some other chick. Yeah, yeah, that hurt me, I'll admit. Forget that, but I'm over with. I hope she getting better safe. Well, isn't this amazing? Excellent, true LTE user experience to the handset over satellite. This was once a myth, but now a reality. I get excited each time I see this, I must admit. Richard? Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry, I'll continue. Um, sorry. Uh, in this part of the webinar, I would like to take you through several use cases that Gilad has implemented all over the world. I'd like to start with this use case, also because it's typical but also because it's the first implementation of our joint acceleration patent with SoftBank. This use case is typical for both connecting the remote regions and providing network backup and emergency services. We will see later some examples of emergency services, but before that, I want to explain that when we say remote regions, we mean areas that are hard to reach with the terrestrial infrastructure, such as islands, vacation resorts, uh, hard to reach tourist attractions, uh, highways. We don't mean necessarily poor areas. Now in this use case, SoftBank are using their small cell LTE network to provide high performance and high availability to enhance user experience. I'd like to share with you the quote we have here from Yasuyuki Imai, the Executive Vice President and Head of the Technology Unit at SoftBank. He said that they offer high-speed LTE services in areas in Japan where it is difficult to install fixed-line backhaul cost-effectively and quickly. Now we will be able to offer our customers LTE speeds. We also expect to see the application of this technology to the mobile network of our group company, Sprint, in the United States. And indeed, a while after, a year or two after, we managed to uh, close a deal with Sprint, and I'll be talking uh, about some examples, some use cases with Sprint that are very interesting in a few slides from now. In this example, this time, uh, it's creating a Wi-Fi village. And this is an example here of an initiative of uh, Facebook in Africa. This is an initiative they, they called internet.org, and that's their initiative to bring high-speed broadband connectivity to sub-Saharan Africa. And then what they did is they created a backhaul village Wi-Fi access point. Now we did this together with our partner SES, the satellite operator, who are tailored the service utilizing their satellite. And it was our equipment, our platform, that enabled Facebook's local ISPs uh, in Kenya and in uh, Nigeria to deliver internet services to underserved and unconnected communities. And here, too, I have a quote from uh, SES and the press release they put out after uh, this deployment. They said, SES has the solutions and satellites that can satisfy Facebook's demand to enable and provide broadband connectivity for express Wi-Fi. Now, this example here, this time in Australia, we see the expansion of Optus's network with Gilad's small cell over satellite solution into the South Australia and Northern Territory. Here in this example, time to market was... In other words, this is of course a major advantage of deploying satellite backhaul, but that was really a top concern for them. So in addition to cost, or kept down with the small cells, there was uh, also a uh, very uh, fast uh, deployment with very efficient integrated uh, small cell to the VSAT network. 
see the image on the bottom right, Cellage SDR. This is our small cell uh, solution that's integrated with our VSAT. We have a technology partner uh, that is the one where we're getting the small cell, and we've done very tight integration to deliver the small cell over satellite, both with high efficiency and uh, very, uh, very uh, high performing. Here, too, we have a quote from the Vice President of Opsys uh, Satellite. From he says that it enables us to provide mobile connectivity to unserved and underserved areas. It's an innovative and cost-effective solution to address our requirements for delivering a high-quality user experience under challenging environmental conditions in regional Australia. I'd like to show you a video that was done by the Australian 7 News Channel. Uh, they show uh, the excitement for those who now have connection due to satellite in the Australian outback. And as you'll hear in a minute from this video of the news broadcast, uh, the, the, the broadcaster says that being able to communicate in the outback can be the difference between life and death. Hello, William Creek Pub. Being able to communicate in the outback can be the difference between life and death. A simple phone call is a historic moment for William Creek with its satellite small cell officially turned on today. It's a welcome development for those who've been out of touch in their travels. I'm stoked. I haven't had coverage for like a week crossing the Nullarbor and staying at Wolfina Town. I fly into William Creek and here is my phone working. But there is a catch. It's only available to Optus customers. I'm going to have to change back to Optus. The beauty of the system is that if, even if you're on another telco and you get in and you need to make an emergency call, you'll be able to dial triple level 112. The tyranny of distance remains as you'll need to be within a four kilometre radius of the cell, but it's the first of 15 such sites in SA. It's not very expensive and yet it's something that we've fought for for quite some time. The mobile network not only increases safety for travellers, but gives outback businesses a massive boost. At William Creek, Peter called. Well, that was uh, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Now we have another example, and that's a network resilience and backup in the UK. This use case here is with EE, Everything Everywhere, which is now part of the BT Group. And the application I want to emphasize here is, really, as I said, the network resilience and backup. And that was their key objective in addition to providing coverage throughout the UK. And this is done both with fixed and portable sites. And I want to point out this time to the uh, portable site on the right-hand side. You see here an example of an on-the-pause deployment. You see here a vehicle that has on it also the VSAT and all, also the cell. And we see here that this is a, an example of uh, often of emergency uh, response teams also that go into the field in order to give uh, uh, an answer when the connectivity has gone down. Oops, I apologize. We have here a quote from uh, Mansour Hanif, the Director of Radio Access Networks at EE. He says, Gilat's world-class cellular backhaul over satellite solution will play a key part in enhancing our 4G network resilience and helping us to extend the net network even further into rural areas as we carry on our journey to cover 95% of the UK landmass. So as you can see here, uh, EE had really had uh, two uh, issues that they wanted to uh, solve. They wanted to be able to cover 95% of the landmass, but they also wanted to provide network resilience and backup. And both of those now are met with the uh, GILAT VSAT uh, network. Full end-to-end managed service project in the Philippines with Globe Telecom. Globe are the leading full-service telecom company in the Philippines. They operate one of the largest broadband networks in the country. I want to remind you that earlier in the webinar, we discussed complexity of satellite backhaul as one of the myths. But then we noted how satellite backhaul can be a managed service, treated like a black box. 
Well, that's exactly what's happening now at Globe Telecom in the Philippines. We provide services of communication where the SLA is the main goal. So Gilad here in this example is responsible for the satellite capacity, the, delivers, the deliveries, the installations, the equipment. We provide all services necessary to make operations smooth and, uh, of course, more cost effective. And also, Gilad operates the hub 24 by 7, as well as the remote sites. And here, too, we have a quote, this time from Globe Senior Vice President for Technical Service Design, Emmanuel Estrada. And he says, this is a breakthrough project for Globe. By using Gilad's innovative visa technology, we can deliver mobile broadband data services in remote rural areas that previously had no connectivity in a cost-effective manner quickly augment our transmission capacity and our 4G network to meet ever-increasing mobile data usage. Well, here another quote from a country deploying the VSAT uh, network for backhaul. Now here in this example, I want to focus here, to, this is with Sprint, and I want to focus here the, on the Metro Edge. Because I want to make a point that backhaul is no longer only used for rural areas. So in this implementation, uh, Sprint wanted to extend their nationwide network into the metro edge. These are often, this metro edge is often suburban areas where the population is sparsely populated. And time to market, again, here is key in order to reach uh, additional subscribers before the competition. And with Sprint, I have another example here that is very important these days. This application of satellite backhaul supporting the emergency response team is very relevant, as I just said, because of the massive destruction caused to terrestrial infrastructure by the recent uh, hurricanes in America. See here a couple pictures here on this uh, slide that are showing Gilat's VSAT that are being deployed now in Puerto Rico and in Virgin Islands. They're being deployed by Sprint and by another MNO, uh, another customer of ours. And notice here on the right-hand picture, on the right of the picture, you can see here the microwell that fell down here in the storm. Uh, and you see in the front of the picture, that's the Gilat uh, VSATs that have been put in place by the emergency response team. And here's a quote from them saying, while ERT continues to support communications restoration efforts in Puerto Rico, additional ERT members deploy infrastructure in support of the wildfires near Santa Rosa, U.S. Now, this is another example here of where the ERTs went up to Santa Rosa, that's northern California, where they had the, the wildfires that were really disastrous there. And again, the infrastructure had to be replaced with satellites. And see here on the right, the satellite cellular on light truck. It's also called sat cult. This is here uh, an example of how uh, ERT uh, functions and Sprinter actually upgrading their nationwide ERT with uh, Gilat's uh, LTE solution. I have here another example. This is not live deployed yet, but it's still very interesting. It's uh, being uh, tested right now. And this is an example also from Sprint of uh, emergency services, but this time with a drone. So note first the image is on the right. You see on the top, we see the drone. It has on it a small cell. And you can see in the back of the picture, you can see the light truck, which provides the satellite backhauling by Gilad. Now actually, uh, look on the bottom uh, picture, you can see better the light truck with the Gilad VSAT. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side the drone flying there over the trees. So let's watch this video that Sprint calls their magic box. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Today we are in rural Texas, 30 miles outside of Dallas, for the next extension of our toolbox. We have here a Sprint aerial small cell. We are developing this together with our partners Sci-Fi and Airspan. This aerial small cell is designed to be a rapidly deployable, cost-effective solution. 
And in our initial testing, it's operating on our 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. By putting a small cell into the sky, we can literally fly in data services to areas we otherwise might not be able to reach. And it's covering up to 10 to 20 square miles. We are testing it for use during concerts, sport events, or natural disasters such as hurricanes or flooding. We know how important our role is to provide communications to first responders and provide a lifeline to our customers. In this case, we can say there is magic in the air. Well, pretty impressive, isn't it? Richard, back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Dorit. Um, just another quick reminder to keep your questions coming. Um, I'm just going to turn back to Dorit to give us a quick overview of Gilat's marketing position before we conclude with the presented segment of our webinar today. Dorit. Okay, um, I don't want to bore you with a lot of details, um, but I do want to focus on uh, three very important points that uh, that's what Gilad is about in order to bring affordable, true LTE backhaul in the case uh, of uh, the audience today because, of course, we deal with many other applications that use a satellite. But for uh, affordable, true LTE backhaul, one of the important points is, of course, innovation. And we talked quite a bit about that. We talked about the gives a user experience uh, that is uh, overcoming the inherent satellite delay that is like uh, terrestrial. And the fact that acceleration is integrated into the VSAT, that is very important. And we talked about the difference of having an acceleration right, uh, solution. And uh, also we uh, talked about, and I'd like to point out, the reduced OPICs with the maximum bandwidth efficiency. That was talking about the uh, MFT DMA and how bandwidth sharing is really the way to go when we have the very bursty traffic with the high peak to average ratio. And we didn't talk about, but I do want to just mention in a sentence, that we have uh, an architecture for our baseband. Our, actually, our whole VSAT network is based on a very scalable um, cloud architecture that allows very large distributed HDS networks. That's also uh, very important and contributes to the uh, great results that we're seeing in the field. Now, the next point is expertise. And that's also a very important point on why we're able to deliver what we're delivering. And this has to do with the end-to-end -end services of what we call a worry-free network. So this is exactly what we were talking about before, about reducing the complexity and having a, a managed uh, service that is like a black box for the mobile operators. Uh, this can include the VSAT equipment, the satellite uh, capacity, the connectivity, the remote network operation, the field operation, the call center support, you know, all that. And in addition, we have the expertise in integrating uh, into the uh, ground segment the satellite network, and that's the layer two uh, integration that I talked about before, which is also very important. And the third point, which is maybe uh, the most important, as people often say, the proof is in the pudding, experience is the choice for the world's leading service providers really around the world. You see here EE in the UK and United States, SoftBank in Japan, Globe in the Philippines, Australia. This here all is a uh, testament, I think, to uh, the strength of Gilad in making a difference with uh, satellite backhaul uh, over LTE. Okay, thanks very much, Dorit. So hopefully we've given you some food for thought regarding satellite as a viable solution for LTE backhaul and a, a number of other applications. Uh, so let's just summarize. We've seen satellite used in a range of mobile network scenarios um, from rural edge, uh, sorry, from rural deployments to metro edge to dense urban deployments. And we've also seen it in different application scenarios, small cells, medium-large macro cell sites. Uh, so we can see that satellite fits a range of those applications. We've seen fixed, nomadic, on-the-move services. So very flexible in terms of how it can be deployed. We've seen that satellite delivers ample capacity. Uh, it delivers terrestrial-grade user experience uh, compared to other 
backhaul technologies available and also comparable economics. And, and finally, uh, just to note that satellite really is adopted worldwide by some uh, tier one operators as well as uh, more specialist operators. So on that note, I'm just going to turn back to Dorit to have the final word before we move into our Q&A segment. Dorit. Okay, thank you, Richard. As we sum up the webinar, I'd like to stress that LTE satellite backhaul is now both viable and economical. And I'd like just to remind you of the myths that were debunked in this webinar. So first, there was a myth about performance that can't be met with satellite backhaul. And of course, uh, we've explained and demonstrated, uh, I think, thoroughly that that's uh, definitely a myth. We're talking about 150 megabits per second to the handset over satellite, and that has to do a lot with the patented uh, acceleration uh, technique that we have uh, together with SoftBank and uh, many other um, uh, technical advantages that I won't go into right now. But we're really seeing here performance at terrestrial grade, and uh, that's uh, very impressive. The second myth that we came to debunk was about the expense, about the cost. And we're seeing here that the cost is rivaling terrestrial solutions in many cases. And we're seeing that the cost is continue to, continuing to go down. As a matter of fact, continue, is, is expected to go down even further as we see uh, launches of more of the LEO and NEO satellites that will, call, that will bring even more capacity into the sky. And the third point has to do with complexity, and we've negated that or debunked that misconception with several ways. One, I talked about the network management system, having a global centralized network manage management system definitely reduces complexity. I talked about integrating at layer two, which reduces complexity. And maybe the bigger, uh, more important one, or just as important but a, a larger topic, is having the whole satellite backhaul as a black box. In other words, having the managed service done by the satellite backhaul provider to enable the uh, mobile operators to focus on their uh, core competencies and to deal with what's uh, important to them and to really outsource and, or do this as a managed service to the uh, experts in satellite backhauling. And we're seeing here uh, really that there's a suite of services that simplifies deployment when it's uh, being done uh, for you to meet your uh, SLA uh, without leaving any of the headache to you. So that definitely reduces complexity. So the uh, bottom line here really also is that there's multiple relevant applications and use cases that we discuss that are deployed worldwide. And that, of course, is what's making the difference. And we're seeing that this is really not theory, but uh, actuality around the world in many continents. So thank you all for listening. I'm uh, Happy to have delivered this to you, and of course, we'll be available now for the Q&A. Thanks very much, uh, Dorit, and, and again, uh, an excellent presentation and much, much for us all to think about. So thank you very much for sending in your questions. We're going to tackle as many as we can in the next few minutes. Uh, what I'm going to start off with uh, is, for Dorit is a question about scale and, and how satellite backhaul can support large networks. It's something we didn't talk about so much in the webinar. Dorit, you know, can satellite support large network backhaul requirements? Uh, sure, absolutely. As a matter of fact, we have quite a few large networks around the world. I can't talk about all of them, but uh, we do have uh, very large networks. And we have this architecture that I briefly uh, mentioned uh, in my uh, closing statements. We call it X architecture, and that really is a distributed architecture that allows us to uh, uh, grow a network as much as required, uh, but it doesn't uh, the mobile operator a lot to get started. In other words, you can start small and grow by adding network segments or adding capacity as required when you need more VSATs for more nodes. And absolutely, yes, you can scale uh, very uh, nicely and, and cost effectively as required. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK, uh, let's take uh, one of our other questions. This one's regarding uh, network management, which uh, you, you did mention in your section about the myth of uh, satellite backhaul's complexity. Now, taking into account the, the costs of, of network management, what's the minimum number of sites that uh, a, a VSAT uh, can, you know, is needed for a VSAT to justify the cost 
um, you know, how do we how do we respond to that? The, the the cost of network management versus minimum number of sites. I think that's a, a pretty individual case by case issue. I think it's hard uh, to answer that uh, globally. It really depends on the complexity of the network and uh, what kind of traffic you have. I think that's not something that can be answered so well generically, but uh, we do see that the uh, global network management brings tremendous value and is actually very uh, simple to use and makes the uh, the work uh, very uh, very cost effective. So there is a great return on investment in using a network management system. Of course, if you have two or three, then it's not relevant, but I don't know if to tell you what the break-even number of VSATs is. But of course, if that's an important question, someone, we can explore that further uh, via email or a phone call. Sure, and, and just as a reminder to all, all of those of you asking questions, if we don't get round to your particular question, uh, Dorit and her team at Gillat will be able to follow up with you all uh, directly offline in the days coming. Uh, but we have time for a couple more questions, so I'm going to push on. Uh, we have a question here about the number of LTE mobiles uh, that, that a satellite can be a uh, satellite backhaul connection can handle uh, in a particular cell without degradation of user experience. So it's, it's kind of related to uh, network performance as the volume of traffic or volume of devices scales up on a particular cell. Here again, it really, of course, depends on uh, on the skills of the people designing the network and what the SLA is. And of course, the, pl the whole planning of the satellite network has to do exactly with what kind of load we're talking about, uh, peak uh, hours, what is what, how many cells, what is the uh, required uh, performance, and all that has to be planned very carefully and, of course, constantly monitored, and that's exactly what uh, the people who uh, manage the network do all the time. It's not just a one-time setup, but it's a constant uh, monitoring of the network to make sure the uh, performance is uh, uh, exactly according to the SLA. Now, because there's many times that uh, a particular cell is maybe not active or sometimes, you know, it's, as I've mentioned before, it's between the cells and it's within the cell, the voice and the data. And all that has to be monitored, of course, very carefully. Okay, really as a thank you very much. Answer. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair enough. Okay, uh, we have a question. Uh, I'm going to try and summarize several questions related to 5G, and I guess, it, again, it's, it's around network performance. Um, so, so how is satellite backhaul evolving with the evolving demands of 5G backhaul? Well, how does Gilad really, uh, that? Yeah, this is, a, this is an important topic, and uh, Gilad, as a leader in this area, is involved with a committee. It's called... Uh, is it called? It's called uh, uh, 5G SAT, I think. And that's the uh, committee that is commissioned by the uh, Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission. And the goal here is to is uh, really for uh, to create a seamless integration of satellite into 5G. And we are very active in this uh, committee to do exactly that. But there's a lot of work ahead, and uh, we're busy there with uh, other partners. Uh, and this is being funded by the European Commission because, of course, it's a big task as 5G will roll out. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take one last question, and uh, apologies to those who didn't have their question answered live. Uh, this question is about the use case in Australia that you put up on screen earlier, Dorit. Uh, are there small cells in this particular deployment? Could you elaborate a little bit on that uh, particular deployment? Oh. Uh, sure. As a matter of fact, extension of the satellite network of uh, Optus using small cells to get to the uh, back uh, outback regions there in Australia. And this was a, a very important uh, point for them because it reduces the um, cap it through the low cost equipment and the low installation cost. So this was uh, actually a very uh, exciting deployment for us because as I mentioned, it's working with our technical partner on the small cell that we are providing. We're providing here a full solution that includes the small cell that is working with our VSAT uh, over satellite. And this integration, this tight integration that we're doing gives also the, the better efficiency in terms of the use of the bandwidth as well as, as the higher performance. So we're very excited actually about this 
performance, this uh, performance of the small cell, and it's a small cell that we call SDR, that's software defined radio, and it can work concurrently in 3G and 4G. So that's a, a very uh, exciting, innovative cell that we're using. Okay, thank you very much, Dorit. That's all, to all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening in, and uh, I'm going to hand back to Alan Tatara, our web events moderator, to conclude today's presentation. Alan. Thank you, Richard. I would also like to thank everyone for participating on our webinar today and for submitting all of your questions and comments. As Richard mentioned, we will be following up with you uh, via email to answer all of those questions we did not get to. I do want to thank Richard for leading our discussion as well as Dorit for this uh, very uh, informative webinar as well. So an archived version of this webinar will be made available shortly, so feel free to come back and view the session again or even share it with your colleagues. Now you're also going to see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of the webinar, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And make sure you follow us on Twitter for information on future IHS Market Technology Group webinars. So again, thank you for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.